So hello everyone, we're having our 15th session of Eurasian online seminar and our guest today is Thierry de Montreal, probably the most well-known, renowned uh, specialist on foreign affairs, international relations in France. And we're happy, very happy to have him. My name is Alexander Lukin, I'm head of Department of International Relations and the International Laboratory on World Order Studies and the New Regionalism of the National Research University High School of Economics. And it's our 15th session of our Eurasian online seminar. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor de Montbrial, who today is going to talk about uh, has the virus changed the international system? Thierry de Montbrial is the executive chairman of the French Institute of International Relations, known as IFRI, uh, which he founded and headed since 1979. In 2008, he also launched the World Policy Conference. Professor de Montbrial graduated from Ecole Polytechnique and Ecole de Mines, which are, I think, engineering schools in France, very famous, and received a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. He was professor at Ecole Polytechnique since 1974 and chaired its department of economics between 1974 and 1992. Uh, he is also professor emeritus at the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers, excuse my French, uh, which is, I think, a graduate college in France. And he was also the chairman of the French-Austrian Center for European Economic Convergence uh, from 85 to 2015. He is on the board on several, uh, 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 several industries and, and companies. In June 1992, he was elected a member of the Institut de France. It's like Academy of Sciences uh, in France, uh, and which he was also elected chairman in the year 2001. He was also a founding member of the Académie de Technologie. He is also a foreign member of quite a number of several academies of, of sciences, including the Russian Academy of Sciences. So Professor de Montbrial is also the author of many professional articles and of 20 books, several of them translated in various, into various languages in economics and international affairs. And some of them are translated into the Russian language. And I had an honor to be present at the presentation in Moscow of his last book, last book or books, Russian translation. So we're delighted to have him here with us, one of the great European thinkers of our times. Please, Professor de Montreal, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alexander, and thank you, friends. Uh, I think I have some of them uh, participating in this uh, exercise. Uh, I hope you are all uh, well and safe, and I trust you are, because if not, you would not be uh, here listening to me uh, at the present time. So uh, let's now talk about, uh, well, the international system. The question uh, is, uh, has uh, the virus uh, changed uh, anything in uh, the uh, international system as such? Well, I think the uh, answer uh, is uh, quite uh, simple. I think this uh, virus has acted not only for the international system, but in many uh, other areas as a catalyzer, as an accelerator of uh, pre-existing uh, uh, tendencies. It has also uh, in some ways uh, it shown, you know, stressed uh, some uh, weaknesses, in particularly, for instance, in the economic uh, field, uh, uh, but more generally in uh, the governance, in the governance uh, area, uh, internally in many countries and regionally, internationally. Uh, that, I think, is relatively uh, clear. Uh, 
Now, if the question is, has the international system changed or will, it, will it change as a, a consequence of the coronavirus, my answer is no. My answer is negative. The only comparison uh, that comes in my mind in uh, my personal history, that is in uh, the world uh, as I have uh, seen it in my life, I think the only comparison I can think of is uh, September 11, uh, 2001. Uh, because, you know, for those of you who are old enough to, to remember well this 9-11 uh, story, the question, we were all uh, under shock. It was so uh, unforeseeable uh, that we are all uh, very, short, very shocked. And I remember the next day, the 12th of September, uh, I happened to participate in a meeting, in IISS meeting in Geneva. The question we are all asking, uh, will the world of tomorrow be totally different from the world of yesterday? Always the same question, you know, is it going to be a new world, uh, the past and the future? And uh, many people thought that there could be uh, uh, tragedies like 9-11, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, rec in, in a recurrent manner. Perhaps the uh, next day, I remember some of us were speculating of a, a major aggression, for instance, in the San Francisco Bay uh, area. But the fact is that, uh, at least in the U United States, there were, there were not one single comparable uh, event uh, in the following, not only years, but, but decades. Uh, maybe the even older people can uh, remember the discussions in the early 70s. I happen to have been also the first uh, director of the policy planning staff in the French foreign ministry that was in the uh, 1970s. And the big question when I started my uh, career there, a big question was about uh, proliferation uh, of nuclear weapons. It's, it is still a major issue, non-proliferation. But at the time, the issue was that it uh, had become supposedly more and more easy, easier and easier to build nuclear weapons. And so it was said. And uh, they also said that it would be extremely easy, for instance, to disseminate a few grams of plutonium in the rivers, and uh, thus uh, to transform the, the, the world and to create a totally different world. It did not happen. Uh, I'm not saying that proliferation has not taken place, but it has taken place in much, much more, uh, much more restricted way, uh, as uh, many people uh, thought. And uh, it also so happens that uh, uh, from a technological and economic viewpoint, it is still quite difficult to acquire uh, nuclear uh, weapons or weapons of arms destruction. And uh, especially if you also consider the delivery uh, weapons and all that. So what I am trying to say is that it is not so easy to change the world. Now, the problem the, uh, with the pandemic is uh, that although it was highly predictable and it, it had been predicted by many uh, people uh, in, in some details uh, also, uh, but uh, it was the kind of prediction uh, which is very difficult uh, to use in uh, operational terms because you cannot uh, tell about the date when it happens. It's like earthquakes, you know, you know, it's very easy to know where earthquakes can take place or will take place, but it is still now impossible to predict exactly the dates. Even a few minutes earlier, you cannot predict uh, a particular uh, earthquake. So uh, to say that the pandemic would happen, well, uh, but uh, to say how, when it could happen was a totally uh, different story. This is why the whole world actually was uh, taken by surprise. And uh, no country, there is not a single country uh, that uh, has been uh, 
saved from uh, this uh, epidemic. And uh, I think in, we will learn a lot uh, from this uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, the next one or the next ones uh, will be probably less tragic because we will have developed a number of uh, tools and uh, governance uh, uh, and uh, also in uh, medical terms that will allow to, uh, to limit the consequences both from the health sanitary viewpoint and also from the economic viewpoint. So having said that, if I am right, that the pandemic has as such has not changed the world, uh, what can we say about the acceleration of uh, pre-existing uh, tendencies? And here are two, I think uh, the uh, answers uh, are relatively uh, simple. What were the pre-existing tendencies? Let's say uh, until, uh, let's say the, uh, the end of last year be before uh, anyone started to talk about this uh, uh, now famous uh, COVID-19. Uh, well, the number one trend is that uh, today there are two superpowers in the world and I hope I will not offend every, everybody in Moscow if I say that Russia is not one of them. The two uh, superpowers now are clearly the United States of America and China. And uh, China is likely to be more and more a superpower in uh, the coming years and decades. In fact, uh, I want to spend a minute or two on that because uh, China has uh, achieved since the end of the 70s of last century, since uh, 1979 to be very precise, that is uh, since uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, acceded to, to power, uh, China has achieved what the Japanese had done exactly one century earlier, or a little more than one century earlier, under the so-called Meiji era, after 1868, to be uh, very precise. At the time, uh, the Chinese, uh, under the last uh, dynasty, dynasty, the Qing uh, uh, dynasty, <clears throat> had not been able to do the reforms. There were a group, there were reformers, but uh, it, it was uh, exactly uh, as uh, the, the reformers uh, under Mao Zedong uh, in the 20th century, the, the reformers were defeated by the conservative. So uh, the, Chinese, the Chinese lost one century. And uh, the Japanese, you know, it took them about 40 years to, uh, reach a level uh, which uh, allowed them to become um, one of the major uh, powers in the first uh, half of the uh, uh, 20th century and remaining another major power in the second half of the 20th century, but of course in a very different way because it was uh, after World, Wide, uh, World War II and uh, uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. But my point is that it took a small number of decades for uh, Japan to move uh, from the state of a feudal state to a hypermodern power in uh, the uh, early, as soon as the early uh, 20th century. China has done the same. And uh, in fact, we are exactly 40 years after the beginning uh, of the reforms. Mao, Mao Zedong reunited the country. And of course, it, it was a terrible experience because uh, uh, it, it, was, it was not an easy, uh, uh, an easy uh, victory, this uh, reunification uh, during the uh, Mao uh, era. And once the 
reunification of the country was achieved under Mao, it made it possible to undertake the second stage, which, were, which was the economic reforms. And now, uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, the, 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 the task is over in, 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 in China, certainly not. And this is uh, why uh, I do not agree with one interpretation of uh, the uh, uh, two city, the strap story of uh, Graham Allison. Uh, I, I think that nobody today, uh, certainly not uh, the Chinese nor the United States is willing to go into war anytime soon uh, because of the competition. But one of the reasons for that is that uh, if a war would take place today between the two countries, uh, I think that at least in the short term, uh, the, the Chinese could not uh, win uh, the, the, the war in the short term, and not to talking about uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence, uh, and all that. So my main point is that nobody uh, w wants a war. And also the uh, interdependence today between China, the United States, and the rest of the world uh, has uh, nothing that can be compared to the situation with the Cold War between uh, the West, or the so-called West, and the Soviet Union uh, at the time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, even before the, 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 the virus, uh, the, the tension uh, between, as everybody knows, between the United States and, uh, uh, and, and China uh, had become to be stronger and stronger. And uh, it's not uh, only Trump. You know, Trump uh, changed, in a way, the, 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 the style of Trump, of course. It's very different from uh, the, the, the style of the previous a traditional uh, American uh, presidents. But in terms of substance, uh, the uh, idea that the competition, uh, economic and potentially military and uh, political competition between the United States and China would become tougher and tougher, this had become even before, uh, before Trump. And, uh, and it, it, it could have become uh, as early as uh, the year 2001, when uh, George W. Bush uh, was elected for the first time, if uh, there had not been 9-11, because it is 9-11 in September of 2001, which, if I can say so, distracted uh, the, the United States from uh, the competition, the US-Chinese competition, which was already there. But at the time, 2001 is very interesting because it is also the year uh, the uh, China was uh, accepted into the WTO. But at the time, the uh, American businessmen in particular were more sensitive to the uh, positive aspects of trade with China because it meant uh, low uh, salaries, low wages, cheap uh, labor, and uh, opportunities, of course, to uh, sell uh, American products to, 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 to China. They were not uh, so sensitive at, at, at the time to the long-term consequences of technological transfers and uh, uh, all the things they, 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 they are now uh, uh, mesmerized uh, by. So um, this uh, situation, the fact that uh, now the key issue for the future of the international system in the coming years and decades. This is the uh, China, the US-China competition. And uh, this was already very much visible uh, last, uh, in the last few years, but, uh, 2019 in particular. I think that the virus has accelerated uh, that uh, in, 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 in introducing uh, also the sanitary or health uh, aspect, which uh, nobody had seriously uh, taken talked about before. But it is no more than acceler an acceleration. Of course, the, uh, I come back also to this idea of style. You know, the, the Trump uh, factor. Uh, when he uh, speaks, uh, for instance, of the Chinese uh, virus and this sort of, of, of language and uh, is, uh, it, it fuels the fire, uh, but it's uh, more uh, in an emotional way. Now, if you talk about international organizations, uh, the uh, 
uh, particular, part, particularly the World um, uh, Health Organization, uh, it's clearly too that there is nothing really new because in international organization you have a competition for power too, of course, within each international organization because international organizations, uh, the, the, the power game in international, in international organizations uh, reflects uh, agreement and the balance of forces at a particular moment of time. So the fact that China, for instance, uh, is trying uh, everywhere in all international organizations to, to increase uh, its, uh, uh, its, its share uh, and to uh, trying to also to uh, have more and more Chinese appointments and so forth and so on. All that is quite natural. It's uh, just a power game and uh, international organizations are part of the, of, the, of the power game. The, the rules, the international rules, the rules of the game are part of the competition. They uh, have to be changed and modified over, over time. So uh, this is uh, the, uh, do dominant, uh, the, the dominant factor. And of course, it impacts every, everything else. You know, we are talking of other raising power, for instance, India. We are, there is a lot of discussion. There are a lot of discussions about new geopolitical concepts, such as, for instance, India-Pacific. But you know, a, a, a geopolitical concept remains an intellectual exercise as long as uh, it is not embodied in uh, institutions, for instance, uh, uh, ASEAN uh, or the European Union, of course, uh, exists. It's much more than a geopolitical, these are much more than geopolitical concepts in the sense that uh, they have become this kind of organizations, they have become a real uh, organizations with institutions uh, with uh, uh, also legal uh, arrangements of all kinds and so forth and so on and um, as far as the European Union is concerned uh, there is a very long-term uh, ambition which uh, so far in spite of all the difficulties have been uh, overcome. So uh, you, we, we can uh, observe that there are uh, the, 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 there are searches in, in many parts of the world for new kind of arrangements, but basically uh, the international uh, system is uh, the one inherited from uh, the uh, Cold War times with uh, uh, gradual uh, changes, but I would say no major changes except two. One is the uh, gradual uh, destruction of so-called multilateralism. And the uh, second one, I would focus on a subject which is perhaps of more interest for uh, Western-Russian relations. Uh, as for multilateralism, the, the word, the concept of multilateralism has at least two faces. Uh, one is for uh, people who believe in international law. Uh, everybody, of course, uh, attaches importance to international law, but some people think that international law is uh, the uh, way the world should be organized. That is, uh, they believe, these people, that the power relations uh, uh, are second uh, to legal relations. Of course, I think this is very naive in the current uh, state of the world. But be that as it may, uh, for this kind of people, uh, the multilateralism means the UN system, the United Nations system, in all its uh, aspects. And uh, in that sense, if you take that interpretation of multilateralism, uh, there is uh, no uh, possible discussion. Multilateralism is uh, less, much less respected than it was uh, before because major powers more and more uh, want to use, inter to manipulate, if you wish, international law to their advantage. This has always been the case, but it is even more so. And uh, the still number one country in the world, the United States, uh, with uh, President Trump, uh, 
shows absolutely, well, shows total disrespect to, to international law. So uh, this is uh, quite uh, dangerous because if uh, the uh, despise for international law goes so far as uh, to uh, destroy uh, international, the major international organizations, which could happen, uh, then uh, we uh, might uh, go back to a pre-Second World War situation. It could be extraordinarily uh, dangerous. Uh, to reformulate my point, reforming uh, the uh, international network of institutions, moving ahead in some ways with uh, international law, uh, has to be done, you know, uh, again, uh, with the uh, power relations uh, changing, this has to be somewhere or another reflected into uh, the uh, existing network of international organizations and the, uh, 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 in particular, you know, the voting rights and this sort of thing. But if we let the, the, this system to be weakened so far at the, the end of the day, it would collapse, that could be a tragedy. So this is one uh, aspect of uh, multilateralism. In fact, I say two, uh, in fact, I have three. The second uh, aspect is more Western because in fact, uh, multilateralism in a regional way worked relatively well during the Cold War uh, in the West camp because uh, at the time there was a, a clear leader that was the United States and the Western uh, uh, system of uh, organizations with uh, worked relatively well. Uh, even if uh, you had the countries like France, uh, Gaullist uh, France, which uh, claimed independence, claimed independence, but nevertheless uh, remaining very loyal to the Western system, the NATO Atlantic Alliance and so forth and so on. So this uh, side uh, of the picture uh, shows also weakening. Uh, the, uh, the, the Western multilateralism is also undermined. It is undermined by two, for two reasons. One is a natural reason, which is that uh, after the end of the Cold War, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, security justification of NATO uh, was, uh, of course, much uh, more difficult to elaborate, and we are still uh, there to a, large, to, a large, uh, to a large extent. And the other reason is, uh, once again, the Trump uh, factor who shows, again, total despise for uh, NATO and the, and the West in, in general. And I am not uh, sure that uh, if Mr. Biden, for instance, were sleepy Joe as a uh, as Trump calls him, were to be uh, elected. I am not, I, I'm sure the style again would change, but I am not sure that uh, uh, the, the United States uh, would uh, totally uh, well, go back to the uh, pre-existing situation. It's uh, totally unrealistic in my judgment to believe so. So I corrected myself, I, my third, the third aspect of multilateralism uh, is uh, that during the Cold War, we had, between the United States and uh, the Soviet Union, uh, with uh, some participations of the Europeans, we had uh, elaborated uh, this extraordinary uh, uh, new uh, adventure of um, arms control, uh, including uh, aspects such as uh, confidence building measures and, and, and the like. And this, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, and unfortunately too, I have to say that uh, the responsibility for that uh, is uh, very much on the shoulders of the United States. This uh, uh, heritage is being totally undermined. And this is very uh, unfortunate. It's very unfortunate for the relations between Russia and the US and the West. But it is also unfortunate uh, for the world generally because I think that this arms control experience could and should have been used uh, at the advantage of many uh, other uh, players. So I will conclude because I think we should now uh, spare some time for, for, for discussion. I will conclude 
by making two points. The first one is that, unlike perhaps some of you, I uh, strongly believe in the future of the European Union, in spite of all its uh, difficulties. Why do I say that? Well, I think I have two uh, reasons for saying that. The first one is that if you observe, if you look carefully at the whole history of the European Union, you uh, will see that uh, it has resisted and overcome all, all of the major uh, shocks it had to face. Uh, including in those uh, times where uh, so many people were convinced that it was on, on the verge of collapsing. For instance, uh, typically the financial crisis after 2008, and more specifically uh, 2010, uh, 2011. How can you explain that? I think the answer again is quite simple because uh, when all the members of the EU face the consequences on each of them of such a collapse should it happen, they realize that the cost would be so high, so for each of the members, that it is much more advantageous to make compromises to keep the EU construction working. And uh, if I stay one more uh, minute on this uh, example of the financial crisis of 2008 and especially 10, 11, um, we should remind that uh, the uh, construction of the Eurozone was extraordinarily ambitious. Uh, many, many uh, uh, economists, uh, including starting in the United States, thought that it could never work in the, in the, in the, that it was bound to fail, if you wish. But in fact, the decision to move ahead with the Euro was made in Maastricht in uh, 1992, uh, precisely to offset, to offset the centrifugal forces uh, of the enlargement of the European Union. So uh, this uh, Euro adventure was a political, not an economic adventure, to, uh, I repeat, to offset the centrifugal forces, because the, a, a, a huge unprepared enlargement uh, to uh, former uh, uh, socialist or communist countries of, of Central Europe, uh, such a huge enlargement uh, could have uh, destroyed, actually, uh, or led to the uh, collapse of the European Union uh, in the, at the end of the, of the 20th century. It could very well have happened. And it did not, uh, uh, because the, the, the political will uh, to, uh, to continue with this adventure was uh, uh, at the end of the day uh, very strong. And I think it still is. And it is exactly, uh, I don't have time to go into the details of the last of the recent weeks, uh, during the coronavirus, uh, uh, it is exactly what is uh, happening just now. And I have a second argument, as I said. And the second argument is that uh, what we are trying to do with the European Union is to build a new kind of political unit, uh, totally different from uh, the traditional uh, nation state, and it does not abolish the nation state, uh, but it is a new kind of political unit. I think it will take perhaps one, as, as, as much as one more century, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to make it a full political unit. It cannot be a, a, a very quick uh, process. But uh, if it uh, continues to work relatively well, it is going to be what it is actually, but it is going to be more and more what it is, that is a huge uh, area of uh, uh, wealth, you know, of, uh, and uh, freedom, a number of uh, qualities of values to which a number of people are attached. 
in uh, in this world. In other words, I think the political, the European Union can have some very significant soft power in the coming uh, decades. And the rest of the world understand that uh, quite well, I believe. And my last word will be on Russia. I am among those who are very sad about the way uh, we have collectively missed uh, the exit from uh, the, the Cold War. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, if you look at a realistic uh, balance of power uh, terms, uh, I, I, I think that uh, the, the future uh, of, of Russia is uh, clearly much more uh, on the Western side than on the uh, Asian side, because even if it is absolutely true that uh, uh, Russia uh, is uh, both a European and an Asian or Euro-Asian uh, country, uh, from uh, cultural, historical, geographical viewpoints, it is uh, uh, still, it is relatively close to, to, to Europe and uh, you don't need me uh, to uh, know that the total Russian population east of the Ural uh, mountains is uh, certainly no more than 30 uh, million inhabitants. Uh, of course, if you can uh, spread uh, uh, over something like 10 uh, billion uh, square kilometers, uh, where uh, China of, uh, on only 9 uh, million square millimeters have about uh, 1.3 million inhabitants, just to take one uh, very uh, basic uh, data. So I stop here and uh, I will. Uh, I'm prepared to, uh, for, for, uh, for a discussion uh, with you in the remaining time. Thank you very much for listening to me. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor de Montbriel. It was very interesting and broad ideas. We have some questions, but first I want to ask you myself. I have two questions uh, for you. So first is, uh, you told us about uh, how the world will be will look after the pandemic, but what about the uh, influence of pandemic itself? I heard three opinions. First, that pandemic does not influence anything, and everything will go on uh, after that as it did before. And the second is that people are going to uh, talk more about you know, global issues, because pandemic is a global issue. How to cooperate uh, and fight, you know, climate change and pan future pandemics and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And third is, uh, on the contrary, that it's going only to facilitate the current struggles, like the, like the struggle between, between uh, China and the United States, because uh, we see now that there is a new struggle about pandemic. You know, the United States accuses China that it did everything wrong, and China answers that it's the United States which, which did everything wrong. So these are three, three opinions. How do you see it from, from Europe? And, uh, and the second question is about Japan and China. I think there is some kind of contradiction, uh, a contradiction in what you said. Um, you said that uh, China did what uh, people during the ma major reforms did in, in Japan. But we know that at major reforms, after major reforms, uh, Japan became very nationalistic and began several wars with Korea, with China, and then with the United States. And, and you said that China is not going to be to start a war because of many of, of interdependence between China and other countries, economic interdependence. But we also know that, for example, before Second World War, Germany and Britain were very interdependent. Britain was first trading partner of Germany. The Soviet Union was also an important trading partner of Germany, and there were mutual investment and so on, but it didn't stop them. So what do you think about it? Is China going to be 
uh, more nationalistic and more aggressive, or probably not because of some new factors. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to you. These, of course, are very important uh, questions. I start with the uh, corona uh, virus. You said you heard uh, number three uh, uh, kind of, uh, of opinions. Well, uh, uh, mine, which I, I gave you, is uh, more uh, on the third of them, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that is, uh, that it will not change much except accelerating the existing trends. That was my uh, main argument. However, uh, I would uh, qualify uh, that uh, opinion or judgment on two uh, grounds. First, uh, the coronavirus uh, story is not over yet. That is, uh, 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 it seems that uh, in, in many countries, including uh, mine, in most of uh, Europe now, uh, uh, the, uh, at least the, 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 the first wave is gone. But well, it's not, we still have, of course, to be cautious and so that, but uh, it seems to be, to be gone. Uh, so the question is, uh, will it come back and how? Uh, from what I understand uh, 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 from the experts, and uh, you know the experts are not free uh, from uh, contradictions uh, when they express themselves, that's a, another story, but uh, it, it, we will know next year, probably not uh, this year. So uh, if, if it's like 9-11 in that sense, because if, if it is just the end of the story, full stop, you know, uh, we will have had all of us a quite a painful uh, uh, shock. Uh, there will be a lot uh, of discussions that are starting now in a country like mine, you know, in France. Uh, should uh, uh, have not been totally foolish you know, to destroy our economies uh, for, after all, what uh, was... Uh, just a relatively small event, et cetera, et cetera. So these arguments are starting you know, to appear here and there. But we, 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 my point is that we cannot answer fully uh, this question of the con ultimate consequences of the coronavirus uh, as long as we know, uh, as, as long as we don't know uh, if uh, this uh, pandemic is over or not. So it is probably over for the first wave, but whether there will be a second, third way or not uh, will make uh, the assessment very, very different. Uh, of course, if there is a second wave with a virus that could have uh, mutated in between, uh, if, if there is one, we will be more prepared uh, or less uh, unprepared. But the important point here is that we are interdependent. Uh, and uh, nobody, uh, if even uh, Mr. Kim Jong-un, uh, nobody uh, is isolated from such uh, shock when it happens. So uh, if we recognize that we are the world, you know, the nation, the, the state system, the international system, if we understand that the international system is more and more interdependent uh, in such issues of economic interdependence, of course, even if there is a little bit more protectionism around. But uh, if we recognize fully the new dimensions of uh, interdependence, uh, the uh, health uh, uh, interdependence, uh, pandemics, uh, uh, the uh, uh, climate interdependence, which is now uh, more and more obvious and all these things, it means that multilateralism is very uh, essential, for, 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 uh, essential for the future uh, of, the, uh, uh, for, uh, of, of, of the international system. You know, the, uh, I prefer to, to, to say that than using the broad term, the future of the, of the earth. So, uh, so the positive uh, conclusion uh, that I would draw uh, from this episode is that we are all in the same boat. Uh, in China, uh, uh, United States, uh, Russia, the Europeans, we are all in the same boat uh, because of interdependence. So uh, let us uh, try to 
take the positive uh, consequences. And one of the things I uh, dislike most with the current president of the United States is that he's constantly talking negatively with a lot of vulgarity uh, because he thinks in political terms in a very narrow sense that is the next uh, presidential uh, election. So I think that people like us, we should try to look at the, this uh, episode positively. What, 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 what can we learn positively for, from uh, all this? Now, another uh, extremely interesting um, uh, aspect uh, of, the, of, of your intervention is uh, mentioning the First World War interdependence at the time, the economic interdependence at the time between uh, uh, France and, uh, and, um, and Germany, etc. Uh, I think that when you look uh, at uh, the First World War, what, what strikes me most, and that's related to the uh, issue about Japan, to the point about Japan, what uh, strikes me most is that the dominating spirit of the time was colonialism. Uh, that is, uh, each major power was uh, trying to extend its territorial uh, power for economic reasons, because the, the purpose was to gain access to resources and to uh, dominate uh, uh, other uh, countries economically. That was the essence, the very basic idea of, of, of colonialism. But they all were playing these games. The Europeans were playing these games, the, the, and, and, the, the, and, the, and Japan, of course. Uh, after the Meiji era, during the Meiji era, you know, their population grew very, very fast. I think it was in the beginning of the 20th century, I think the, 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 the Japanese population was uh, uh, almost, almost uh, twice uh, the population uh, pre-existing the Meiji uh, era. So all these people had to be fed also because they, uh, and, and it's very interesting to see that a number of Japanese who actually started to emigrate, uh, even though the country had become um, more rich, but because there were food uh, uh, problems uh, uh, and the like. So the spirit, the, the, the kind of interdependence which existed at the beginning of the 20th century was dominated by the colonial, uh, the colonial factor. Today, uh, uh, today uh, the, economic inter uh, the, the economic international uh, system, the, the, the economic aspects, aspects of interdependence are uh, less, uh, uh, at least uh, in a visible way, they are much uh, less uh, dominated by the uh, territorial uh, dominance uh, aspect. But when I say that, at the same time, uh, I wonder, I wonder sometimes if, if, if there is not a new kind of colonialism uh, that could, uh, that could uh, go on, that could uh, develop. Uh, and uh, if that were the case, it could be a very extremely uh, dangerous uh, game. So uh, on uh, the uh, Thucydides uh, trap, I say that at least in the foreseeable future, what I call foreseeable future is, you know, that span, time span, uh, where you can uh, make reasonable projections. Uh, uh, nobody can say what will happen in, uh, in 2049. If I say 2049, this is, I have a very good reason to say it, of course, because uh, 2049, it will be 100 years uh, after the victory of Mao Zedong in China. And uh, uh, they have openly now the ambition of being the number one uh, country, uh, the first country in the world uh, by then. But you know, 2049 is both very close it's only uh, 29 uh, years from now and very far, you know, to make uh, predictions forecast uh, on uh, three decades is a very uh, difficult uh, task. Uh, 
But uh, if you ask me, do they want the Chinese to be the number one country in the world by then? The answer is clearly yes. And they say it, they say it themselves, no. Uh, but uh, will it take a war? Uh, what kind of wars could it take uh, in between to, to reach that goal? It, uh, very uh, difficult uh, to answer specifically. Uh, there will probably be wars. There has always been wars, unfortunately. Will there be a major war? My, the only can answer I can uh, make at the present time is, in my judgment, not, not in the uh, foreseeable future. That is not in the near future, not in the next few years. But uh, if we want to take the best of uh, interdependence, of the fact that the many countries are developing and so forth and so on, if we want to take the best and to uh, avoid major wars, there is only one possible answer, which is developing multilateralism. I cannot see any other way. Well, thank you very much for your answers. We have a question now from Professor Tatiana Zvereva, who teaches French politics and history here. Uh, please, I'll say. <laughs> Yes, yes, go ahead. Permettez-moi, Monsieur Montréal, de, de vous saluer et de vous exprimer uh, tout mon estime uh, parce que uh, uh, moi, j'étudie uh, personnellement vos, vos travaux depuis, depuis assez longtemps et uh, vos, uh, uh, les, les annuaires, surtout les annuaires Ramsès, c'était très utile pour, uh, pour tout le monde. Uh, et, uh, voilà, j'ai quelques questions et je les pose en anglais, si, si vous permettez. Oui, oui. Well, not everyone speaks French here, so could you ask me questions? Not everyone speaks Russian. Voilà. Uh, et, et alors, uh, uh, my first question is uh, about uh, the uh, meaning of the notion of superpower. What does it mean uh, today? Today, because uh, this uh, notion, uh, this uh, this word uh, uh, is uh, uh, from uh, from the Cold War, uh, Cold War, and uh, now the superpower. Uh, we don't speak uh, about superpowers now uh, uh, during uh, last 20, 20 years and but now we uh, begin to um, to speak about superpower what does it mean from your point of, uh, from your point of view and my second question uh, is about um, uh, France and Russia, uh, 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 as we see, uh, the world uh, is becoming more and more dangerous, uh, uh, and uh, the pandemic uh, ex um, uh, have uh, has ex uh, uh, has um, ex uh, ex accentuated uh, accentuated uh, cette uh, cette, ten uh, cette tendance. Um, uh, uh, um, in spite, uh, in spite that, uh, f first of all, uh, everybody thought the that the world uh, is very um, fra fra fragile, uh, fragile. Le, le monde est, est fragile et l'humanité c'est quelque chose de très fragile. Alors il faut il faut, il faut travailler ensemble. Uh, mais uh, uh, avec avec le temps ça ça revient. Uh, uh, ça revient toujours uh, uh, la notion uh, les, les, la géopolitique uh, ça, uh, elle devient uh, uh, de, de plus en plus active et alors est-ce qu'on peut faire uh, quelque chose la France et la Russie est-ce qu'on peut travailler ensemble uh, pour changer uh, cette tendance uh, uh, what France and Russia could do together in order to change uh, this uh, trend and uh, uh, is it possible Possible to do something now. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Montbrial. Uh, thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, I start with the superpower uh, question. Well, I 
I think uh, at, at a certain level that the answer is quite uh, simple. You know, the uh, superpower, first, the first characteristic of a superpower is uh, the technological uh, primacy. You know, uh, if you ask me, I, I have uh, written on this in one of my books, you know, if you ask me what is the grand strategy, you know, the, the concept of grand strategy, uh, which is not so often used, but what is the grand strategy of the United States of America? Uh, because after all, the administrations will change, uh, uh, sometimes they uh, intervene in a war and after a few years they withdraw because the public opinion has changed and so forth and so on. But what is, what is the, in, uh, the, the, the constant, uh, uh, the, the, in, in the, the, the constant point, you know, the invariant in the, the uh, American uh, grand strategy, this is uh, the, to have the absolute well, military superiority, but a military superiority with technology. Uh, that's that's the, 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 the point. Uh, in fact, uh, and, and of course, behind the technology, you have the economy, because to have a fully superior technological system, uh, you need to have a very strong uh, economy. It's not enough to have uh, good uh, engineers. You have to have a very, very strong economy. So uh, technology, dominancy, uh, a very strong uh, economy, and then a very strong military sector. Uh, but highly modern by, 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 by the standards of, of the time. Of the time, of course, modernity uh, in in 2020 is not the same as uh, uh, 1950. Uh, and uh, the uh, the extraordinary uh, thing about the United States is that so far, so far, it has uh, remained by far, so far. So far, by far, uh, the number one technological country in the in the world. Now, they have been ahead, very much ahead, of the digital revolution in the 70s. Uh, you know, I happened to be a student at Berkeley, as uh, Alexander said, that was in the late 67, 68. And uh, at Berkeley at the time, it was exactly at that time, I didn't know it, of course, by the time, but it was exactly at the time that uh, what uh, would become known as the internet were invented, was invented. That was at Berkeley in the, at the end of the 60s. But it was initially designed uh, to facilitate communication between researchers in the military, uh, in the technological military sectors. So uh, the United States has been very much ahead. And uh, the, the, uh, what is very striking about the US is the relatively subtle way the state in the United States, the government, uh, work with the industrial sector, the military industrial sector, or technological industrial sector. So far, this has been extraordinarily successful. And still today, the U.S. is the number one country, even if uh, China is uh, catching up uh, very far. Uh, but uh, I, I am convinced that if the Soviet Union has lost the, the Cold War, it is primarily uh, because uh, they were not able uh, to, to follow uh, the, the, the U.S. and the uh, arms race and the arms race itself, and they are not able to follow it for these reasons. You know, the the the, the impossibility to 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 remain ahead in the technological uh, in the technological race uh, and a very weak and weaker weaker economy because uh, the economic system was totally rot. Uh, so. Uh, there are, I don't see, uh, apart from the, uh, from the United States and, um, and, uh, and China, I don't see any country which uh, can be put uh, today uh, at, the, at the same level. 
as uh, uh, these two uh, regarding to technology, economy, and military. Uh, the three together. Uh, this does not mean that you do not have uh, some countries with niche uh, strengths. Uh, Russia has very strong points in certain uh, aspects of the digital technologies. Israel has very strong uh, uh, also uh, uh, niche in, the, in these technologies and so forth and so on. And the Europeans are not totally ridiculous in these uh, areas. But it seems to me that uh, the number one characteristic of the superpower uh, are those which I have mentioned. Of course, uh, after that, you have an issue of uh, uh, the capacity uh, and, uh, and, and willingness uh, to project uh, power uh, abroad. And uh, the characteristic of a superpower is a capacity to project power all over the world. Today, the United States can project power everywhere, everywhere in the world, everywhere. And uh, I don't think the, clearly the, the Chinese have not yet this uh, capacity. They will probably have it uh, at uh, some point, unless of an accident. And even that, and then you have other questions, uh, social, political questions. The, the, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, the, the, the United States, in spite of its domestic difficulties today, uh, with the divisions, but on the whole, the United States can still today be seen as a very united country. You know, when, when the, the, the Americans uh, perceive, rightly or wrongly, you know, to be threatened, you can see immediately a uh, uh, very high degree of uh, patriotism, uh, which is not uh, always the case in, uh, in other countries. So this question on uh, what is a superpower is a very interesting one, and uh, I'm, I'm sure it, could be, uh, it should be discussed much further. Uh, now, uh, on uh, what can we do uh, between uh, France and, uh, and, and Russia? Well, uh, if you look at that question from a political uh, standpoint of immediate uh, effectiveness, uh, the answer is very uh, is not, is not easy uh, because. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the climate uh, today uh, is not uh, good uh, for a number. It's not very bad either, but it's not very good because uh, we are in, all entangled in, in, in a number of uh, sticky uh, uh, issues. But uh, I think that what we can and should do, uh, at least because... Uh, it's very important also to work with a long-term uh, spirit uh, is to uh, develop at all the level, especially academic level, think tanks, and so etc. Uh, as well, discussions uh, as deep as possible, as um, uh, trying to avoid, you know, emotions and passions. It's a uh, it's difficult sometimes to, especially when uh, there are issues of, uh, about values, when you talk about democracy, uh, human rights, it's, 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 it's sometimes very difficult to avoid uh, being uh, trapped in, uh, in, in pure emotional exchanges. Uh, so uh, trying to develop uh, all kinds of uh, good faith uh, uh, discussions uh, on uh, uh, short, medium, and long-term aspect is important because I, I, I think that the most important point here is starting with the long term. It's not a contradiction with what I said before because in the long term, of course, we are all dead. In the long term, in the long term, uh, you cannot make, uh, as I said before, specific uh, predictions. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are uh, some uh, broad uh, views that can be uh, taken for granted in the, in the long term, such as the unavoidability of more and more interdependence, uh, uh, some civilization, civilizational uh, aspect, etc. And uh, I, I think that if we, uh, uh, as I do, uh, uh, agree that uh, the 
French-Russian or Russian-French relations is relevant for the long term, no matter what the big power uh, will be in 30 years from now. Uh, then it is not too early uh, to, to start uh, working uh, now, even if the benefits uh, of the discussions are not immediately visible. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I th I'm afraid we have to stop here because uh, Professor de Montbrial said that uh, he only had one hour and we already have one hour, 10 minutes. So. We are sorry about it, and uh, we have a lot of questions, but I hope he can come in person to Moscow very soon. And, uh, very soon, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Well, very soon is a big concert. I'm supposed to go to Geneva in, uh, in, in next week or so, and I, I'm, I'm not uh, even sure that they can do it. <laughs> well, you know, it depends on, you know, for China, even 100 years is very soon, so it doesn't matter. So, but we, we hope to see you sometime in Moscow or in Paris or somewhere else. And we are really happy to have you here uh, because it's a great honor for us. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. It was most interesting. Yes. Thank you. Good, goodbye. Bye-bye. Yes. Oh, okay, recording is on. So, Professor de Montbrel, we are going to begin now. Um, okay, ready. Okay. So, hello everyone. We are having our 15th session of Eurasian online seminar, and our guest today is Thierry de Montbrel, probably the most well known, renowned. Uh, specialist on foreign affairs, international relations in France. And we're happy, very happy to have him. My name is Alexander Lukin. I'm head of Department of International Relations and International Laboratory on World Order Studies and the New Regionalism of the National Research University High School of Economics. And it's our 15th session of our Eurasian online seminar. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor de Montbrial, who today is going to talk about uh, has the virus changed the international system? Thierry de Montbrial is the executive chairman of the French Institute of International Relations, known as IFRI, uh, which he founded and headed since 1979. In 2008, he also launched the World Policy Conference. Professor de Montbrial graduated from Ecole Polytechnique and Ecole de Mines, which are, I think, engineering schools in France, very famous, and received a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. He was professor at Ecole Polytechnique since 1974 and chaired its Department of Economics between 1974 and 1992. Uh, he is also Professor Emeritus at the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers, excuse my French, uh, which is, I think, a graduate college in France. And he was also the chairman of the French Austrian Center for European Economic Convergence uh, from 85 to 2015. He's on the board on several, uh, 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 several industries and, and companies. In June 1992, he was elected a member of the Institut de France. It's like Academy of Sciences uh, in France, uh, and which he was also elected chairman in the year 2001. He was also a founding member of the Académie de Technologie, he is also a foreign member of quite a number of several academies of, of sciences, including the Russian Academy of Sciences. So Professor de Montbrial is also the author of many professional articles and of 20 books, several of them translated in various, into various languages in economics and international affairs. And some of them are translated into the Russian language and I had an honor 
to be present at the presentation in Moscow of his last book, uh, last book or books, Russian translation. So we're delighted to have him here with us, one of the great European thinkers of our times. Please, Professor de Montreal, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alexander, and thank you, friends. Uh, I think I have some of them uh, participating in this uh, exercise. Uh, I hope you are all uh, well and safe, and I trust you are, because if not, you would not be uh, here listening to me uh, at the present time. So uh, let's now talk about, uh, well, the international system. The question uh, is, uh, has uh, the virus uh, changed uh, anything in uh, the uh, international system as such? Well, I think the uh, answer uh, is uh, quite uh, simple. I think this uh, virus has acted not only for the international system, but in many uh, other areas as a catalyzer, as an accelerator of uh, pre-existing uh, uh, tendencies. It has also, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, shown, you know, uh, stressed uh, some uh, weaknesses, in, particularly, for instance, in the economic uh, field, uh, uh, but more generally in uh, the governance, in the governance uh, area, uh, internally in many countries and regionally, internationally. Uh, that, I think, is relatively uh, clear. Now, if the question is, has the international system changed or will, be, it, will it change as a, a consequence of the coronavirus, my answer is no. My answer is negative. The only comparison uh, that comes in my mind in uh, my personal history, that is in the uh, the world uh, as I have uh, seen it in my life. I think the only comparison I can think of is uh, September 11, uh, 2001. Uh, because, you know, for those of you who are old enough to, to remember well this 9-11 uh, story, the question we were all uh, under shock. It was so uh, unforeseeable uh, that we are all uh, very short, very shocked. And I remember the next day, the 12th of September, uh, I happened to participate in a meeting, in IISS meeting in Geneva. The question we are all asking, uh, will the world of tomorrow be totally different from the world of yesterday? Always the same question, you know, is it going to be a new world, uh, the past and the future? And uh, many people thought that there could be uh, uh, tragedies like 9-11, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, in, in a recurrent manner. Perhaps the uh, next day, I remember some of us were speculating of a, a major aggression, for instance, in the San Francisco Bay uh, area. But the fact is that, uh, at least in the U United States, there were, there were not one single comparable uh, event uh, in the following, not only years, but, but decades. Uh, maybe the even older people can uh, remember the discussions in the early 70s. I happen to have been also the first uh, director of the policy planning staff in the French Foreign Ministry that was in the uh, 1970s. And the big question when I started my uh, career there, a big question was about uh, proliferation uh, of nuclear weapons. It is still a major issue, non-proliferation. But at the time, the issue was that it uh, had become supposedly more and more easy, easier and easier to build nuclear weapons. And uh, so it was said. And uh, they also said that it would be extremely easy, for instance, to disseminate a few grams of plutonium in the rivers, and uh, thus uh, to transform the, the, the world and to create a totally different world. It did not happen. Uh, I'm not saying that proliferation has not taken place, but it has taken place in much, much more uh, 
a much more restricted way uh, as uh, many people uh, thought. And uh, it also so happens that uh, uh, from a technological and economic viewpoint, it is still quite difficult to acquire uh, nuclear uh, weapons or weapons of arms destructions. And uh, especially if you also consider the delivery uh, weapons uh, and all that. So what I am trying to say is that it is not so easy to change the world. Now, the problem the, uh, with the pandemic is uh, that although it was highly predictable and it, it had been predicted by many uh, people uh, in, in some details uh, also, uh, but uh, it was the kind of prediction uh, which is very difficult uh, to use in uh, operational terms because you cannot uh, tell about the date when it happens. It's like earthquakes, you know, you know, it's very easy to know where earthquakes can take place or will take place, but it is still now impossible to predict exactly the dates. Even a few minutes earlier, you cannot predict uh, a particular uh, earthquake. So uh, to say that the pandemic would happen, well, uh, but uh, to say how, when it could happen was a totally uh, different story. This is why the whole world actually was uh, taken by surprise. And uh, no country, there is not a single country uh, that uh, has been uh, saved from uh, this uh, epidemic. And uh, I think in, we will learn a lot uh, from this uh, uh, pandemic and uh, the next one or the next ones uh, will be probably less tragic because we will have developed a number of uh, tools and uh, governance uh, uh, and uh, also in uh, medical terms that will uh, allow to, uh, to limit the consequences both from the health sanitary viewpoint and also from the economic viewpoint. So having said that, if I am right, uh, the pandemic has changed, uh, as such, has not changed the world. Uh, what can we say about the acceleration of uh, pre-existing uh, tendencies? And here are two, I think, uh, the uh, answers uh, are relatively uh, simple. What were the pre-existing tendencies? Let's say uh, until uh, let's say the uh, the end of last year, be before uh, anyone started to talk about this uh, uh, now famous uh, COVID uh, nineteen. Well, the number one trend is that uh, today there are two superpowers in the world, and I hope I will not offend every everybody in Moscow if I say that Russia is not one of them. The two uh, superpowers now are clearly the United States of America and China. And uh, China is likely to be more and more a superpower in uh, the coming years and decades. In fact, uh, I want to spend a minute or two on that because uh, China has uh, achieved since the end of the 70s of last century, since uh, 1979 to be very precise, that is uh, since uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, acceded to, to power, uh, China has achieved what the Japanese had done exactly one century earlier, or a little more than one century earlier, under the so-called Meiji era, after 1868, to be uh, very precise. At the time, uh, the Chinese, uh, under the last uh, dynasty, dynasty, the Qing uh, uh, dynasty, <clears throat> had not been able to do the reforms. There were a group, there were reformers, but uh, it, it was uh, exactly uh, as uh, the, the reformers uh, under Mao Zedong uh, in the 20th century 
the, the reformers were defeated by the conservative. So uh, the, Chinese, the Chinese lost one century. And uh, the Japanese, you know, it took them about 40 years to uh, reach uh, a level uh, which uh, allowed them to become um, one of the major uh, powers in the first uh, half of the uh, uh, 20th century and remaining another major power in the second half of the 20th century, but of course in a very different way because it was uh, after Worldwide, uh, World War II and uh, uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. But my point is that it took a small number of decades for uh, Japan to move uh, from the state of a feudal state to a uh, hyper-modern power in uh, the uh, early, as soon as the early uh, 20th century. China has done the same. And uh, in fact, we are exactly 40 years after the beginning uh, of the reforms. Mao, Mao Zedong reunited the country and of course, it, it was a terrible experience because uh, uh, it, it was not an easy, uh, uh, an easy uh, victory, this uh, reunification uh, during the uh, Mao uh, era. And once the reunification of the country was achieved under Mao, it made it possible to undertake the second stage, which, were, which was the economic reforms. And now, uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, the, 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 the task is over in, 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 in China, certainly not. And this is uh, why uh, I do not agree with one interpretation of uh, the uh, uh, two city, the strap story of uh, Graham Allison. Uh, I, I think that nobody uh, today uh, certainly not uh, the Chinese nor the United States is willing to go into war anytime soon uh, because of the competition. But one of the reasons for that is that uh, if a war would take place today between the two countries, uh, I think that at least in the short term, uh, the, the Chinese could not uh, win uh, the, the, the war in the short term, and not to talking about uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence, and all that. So my main point is that nobody uh, wants a war. And also the uh, interdependence today between China, the United States, and the rest of the world uh, has uh, nothing that can be compared to the situation with the Cold War between uh, the West, or the so-called West, and the Soviet Union uh, at the time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, even before the, 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 the virus, uh, the, the tension uh, between, as everybody knows, between the United States and, uh, uh, and, and China uh, had become to be stronger and stronger. And uh, it's not uh, only Trump. You know, Trump uh, changed, in a way, the, 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 the style of Trump, of course. It's very different from uh, the, the, the style of the previous traditional uh, American uh, presidents. But in terms of substance, uh, the uh, idea that the competition, uh, economic and potentially military and uh, political competition between the United States and China would become tougher and tougher, this had become even before, uh, before Trump. And, uh, and it, it, it could have become uh, as early as uh, the year 2001, when uh, George W. Bush uh, was elected for the first time, if uh, there had not been 9-11, because it is 9-11 in September 2001, which, if I can say so, distracted uh, the, the United States.
from uh, the competition, the US Chinese competition, which was already there. But at the time, 2001 is very interesting because it is also the year uh, the uh, China was uh, accepted into the WTO. But at the time, the uh, American businessmen in particular were more sensitive to the uh, positive aspects of trade with China because it meant uh, low uh, salaries, low wages, cheap uh, labor, and uh, opportunities, of course, to uh, sell uh, American products to, 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 to China. They were not uh, so sensitive at, at, at the time to the long-term consequences of technological transfers and uh, uh, all the things they, 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 they are now uh, uh, mesmerized uh, by. So um, this uh, situation, the fact that uh, now the key issue for the future of the international system in the coming years and decades. This is the uh, China, the US-China competition. And uh, this was already very much visible uh, last, uh, in the last few years, but, uh, 2019 in particular. I think that the virus has accelerated uh, that uh, in, in, in introducing uh, also the sanitary or health uh, aspect, which nobody had seriously uh, taken talked about before. But it is no more than acceler an acceleration. Of course, the, uh, I come back also to this idea of style, you know, the, the Trump uh, factor. Uh, when he uh, speaks, uh, for instance, of the Chinese uh, virus and this sort of, of, of language and uh, is, uh, it, it fuels the fire, uh, but it's uh, more uh, in an emotional way. Now, if you talk about international organizations, uh, the, uh, uh, particular, part particularly the World um, uh, Health Organization, uh, it's clearly, too, that there is nothing really new because in international organization, you have a competition for power, too, of course, within each international organization because international organizations, uh, the, the, the power game in international, in international organizations uh, reflects uh, agreement and the balance of forces at a particular moment of time. So the fact that China, for instance, uh, is trying uh, everywhere in all international organizations to, to increase uh, its, uh, uh, its, its share, uh, and to uh, trying to also to uh, have more and more Chinese appointments and so forth and so on. All that is quite natural. It's uh, just a power game and uh, international organizations part of the, of, the, of the power game. The, the rules, the international rules, the rules of the game are part of the competition. They uh, have to be changed and modified over, over time. So uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, dominant, uh, the, the dominant factor. And of course, it impacts every, everything else. You know, we are talking of other raising power, for instance, India, we are, there is a lot of discussion, there are a lot of discussions about new geopolitical concepts, such as, for instance, India Pacific. But you know, a, a, a geopolitical concept remains an intellectual, exercise as long as uh, it is not embodied in uh, institutions. For instance, uh, uh, ASEAN uh, or the European Union, of course, uh, exists. It's much more than a joint policy. These are much more than geopolitical concepts in the sense that uh, they have become this kind of organizations. They have become a real uh, organizations with institutions uh, with uh, uh, also legal uh, arrangements of all kinds and so forth and so on and um, as far as the European Union is concerned uh, there is a very long-term uh, um, ambition uh, which uh, so far in spite of all the difficulties uh, have been uh, overcome. So uh, you, we, we can uh, observe that there are uh, the, 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 there are searches in, in many parts of the world for new kind of arrangements, but basically uh, the international uh, system uh, 
is uh, the one inherited from uh, the uh, Cold War times with uh, uh, gradual uh, changes, but I would say no major changes except two. One is the uh, gradual uh, destruction of so-called multilateralism. And the second one, I would focus on a subject which is perhaps of more interest for uh, Western Rus Russian relations. Uh, as for multilateralism, the, the, the word, the concept of multilateralism has at least two uh, faces. One is for uh, people who believe in international law, uh, everybody of course, uh, attaches importance to international law, but some people think that international law is uh, the uh, way the world should be organized. That is, uh, they believe, these people, that uh, power relations uh, uh, are second uh, to legal relations. Of course, I think this is very naive in the current uh, state of the world. But be that as it may, uh, for this kind of people, uh, the multilateralism means the UN system, the United Nations system, in all its uh, aspects. And uh, in that sense, if you take that interpretation of multilateralism, uh, there is uh, no uh, possible discussion. Multilateralism is uh, less, much less respected than it was uh, before, because major powers more and more uh, want to use, in turn, to manipulate, if you wish, international law to their advantage. This has always been the case, but it is even more so. And uh, the still number one country in the world, the United States, uh, with uh, President Trump, shows absolutely, well, shows total disrespect. To, to international law. So uh, this is uh, quite uh, dangerous because if uh, the uh, despise for international law goes so far as uh, to uh, destroy uh, international, the major international organizations, which could happen, uh, then uh, we uh, might uh, go back to a pre-Second World War situation. It could be extraordinarily uh, dangerous. Uh, to reformulate my point, reforming uh, the uh, international network of institutions, moving ahead in some ways with uh, international law, uh, has to be done, you know, uh, again, uh, with the uh, power relations uh, changing, this has to be somewhere or another reflected into uh, the uh, existing uh, network of international organizations and the, uh, 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 in particular, you know, the voting rights and this sort of thing. But if we let the, the, this system to be weakened so far at the end of the day, it would collapse, that could be a tragedy. So this is one uh, aspect of uh, multilateralism. In fact, I said two, uh, in fact, I have three. The second uh, aspect is more Western because in fact, uh, multilateralism in a regional way worked relatively well during the Cold War uh, in the West camp because uh, at the time there was a, a clear leader that was the United States and the Western uh, uh, system of uh, organizations with uh, worked relatively well. Uh, even if uh, you had the countries like France, uh, Gaullist uh, France, which uh, claimed independence, who claimed independence, but nevertheless uh, remaining very loyal to the Western system, the NATO Atlantic Alliance and so forth and so on. So this uh, side uh, of the picture uh, shows also weakening. Uh, the, uh, the, the Western multilateralism is also undermined. It is undermined by two, for two reasons. One is a natural reason, which is that uh, after the end of the Cold War, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, security justification of NATO 
uh, was, uh, of course, much uh, more difficult to elaborate, and we are still uh, there to a, large, to, a large, uh, to a large extent. And the other reason is, uh, once again, the Trump uh, factor who shows, again, total despise for uh, NATO and the, and the West in, in general. And I am not uh, sure that uh, if Mr. Biden, for instance, were Sleepy Joe, as, uh, as Trump calls him, were to be uh, elected, I am not, I, I'm sure the style again would change, but I am not sure that uh, uh, the, the United States uh, would uh, totally uh, well, go back to the uh, pre-existing uh, situation. It's, uh, totally unrealistic in my judgment to believe so. So I corrected myself. I, my third, the third aspect of multilateralism uh, is uh, that during the Cold War, we had between the United States and uh, the Soviet Union, uh, with uh, some participations of the Europeans, we had uh, elaborated uh, this extraordinary uh, uh, new uh, adventure of uh, arms control, uh, including uh, aspects such as uh, confidence building measures and, and, and the like. And this, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, and unfortunately too, I have to say that uh, the responsibility for that uh, is very much on the shoulders of the United States. This uh, heritage is being totally Undermine. And this is very uh, unfortunate. It's very unfortunate for the relations between Russia 